Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This is our first webinar of the year. We'll be hosting our final workshop of the year in November and one more webinar in December. We'll tell you more about those at the end of today's session. We want to thank you all for joining us and let you know that we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to join us. I'm Tom Concolino, and I'm here with our presenter, Aya Takase. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for attending Regraku's webinar series on X-ray computed tomography for materials and life science. This is our ninth webinar in the series, where Aya will be discussing 4D and in situ applications. They'll focus on the principles and techniques researchers use for real-time CT experiments. Aya will also offer methods for dealing with the unique challenges of performing CT experiments on material science samples. Now, please note, if you missed any of the previous webinars, you can view them on the Rigaku website. But before we start, a few housekeeping items. As far as today goes, as per usual, we will be taking questions during the live webcast, but we won't be answering them until the end. Now, we ask that you submit those questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we will not be monitoring the raised hand or chat features. Now we will be saving the questions you submitted during the webcast and we'll answer as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. If for whatever reason you have difficulty viewing the webinar live, please note it is being recorded and you'll be able to view the recording beginning tomorrow. Okay, and with that said, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Aya Takase. Welcome, Aya. Thanks, Tom. And thank you everyone for joining us for the webinar series. X-ray computed tomography for materials and life science. Today, we will talk about 4D and in situ applications. So new sneakers have elastic and comfortable soles, but they become stiff as they get old. And you might've wondered what exactly is happening to these shoe soles. We can study something like this by looking at X-ray CT scans at of the elastic material under stress. Or I don't know how many of you bake, but when you make bread dough, you have to let it rise and you can shape it and bake it when the dough has fully risen. But how do we know when it has fully risen? Believe it or not, many people use X-ray CT to study dough proofing and baking process. And these are time resolved or environment controlled X-ray CT experiments. The experiment on a factor you control can be either temperature, stress, or something else. And they are called 4D or in situ measurements. And that is what we're gonna talk about today. So in this webinar, you will learn some keys to 4D and in situ CT measurements and how to plan experiments you will also see a number of 4D and in situ application examples. So just to make sure that everybody's on the same page, let's start with this question. So what is 4D CT? 4D CT is a combination of 3D, that's a regular CT, and time. Time is the fourth dimension. So in other words, 4D CT measurements are time resolved CT measurements. The fourth dimension doesn't need to be time. It can be temperature or something else, but generally speaking, when we say 4D CT, we're talking about time resolved CT measurements. What about in situ CT? So the term in situ in Latin means on site or in position. So when we say we're doing in situ measurements, that means that we're doing measurements in the same place the phenomenon is occurring. We're not isolating the sample to do the measurements. Now, when you do 4D or in situ measurements, what should we consider? Maybe differently from regular CT measurements. And there are a couple of things. The first thing is to think about is the duration of the process. And the second thing is the sample environment. Let's start with the duration of the process. Just as an example, let's think about popcorn. This is a process of a popcorn kernel to pop. The duration of this process is less than 0.1 second. It takes only less than 0.1 second for a kernel to pop. Environment-wise, 
you have to heat those kernels up to 180 degrees. This temperature 180 degrees is not that big of a deal. You can use a heating stage or some sort of you know, institute chamber to increase the temperature of the kernels up to 180 degrees. But the duration of the process, 0.1 second, is challenging to say the least. Meaning that, that this is just too short of a time. This process happens too fast. But what exactly is too fast? So to judge whether or not the process you wanna look at using X-ray CD is too fast or not, you can compare the process duration and the CT scan duration. So CT scan duration depends on the CT scanner you use, but in general, it can be anywhere from a few seconds to hours per scan. And to do 4D or in-situ CT measurements, you're gonna need multiple CT scans to study a process. So the process duration needs to be longer than the CT scan duration. So let's go back to the popcorn process. It takes less than 0.1 second for a kernel to pop. And let's say that we need at least four time frames of four CT scans to understand this process. And that leaves us only 0.025 second per CT scan. And that is just not enough time to do a decent CT scan. And that's what I meant by saying that this process happens too fast. Let's think about something a little bit slower. What about a germination process? If it takes, let's say four days for this seed to grow some roots and the first two leaves, and again, we need only four CT scans to study this process, then we have an entire day or 24 hours to do a scan. So we have a plenty of time and this process is slow enough. It's not too fast. Now, just because you have whole day to do a scan, it's probably not a good idea to spend the total 24 hours to do just one scan. And I will explain why this is not a good idea in a second. But anyway, when you look at the process you wanna study using X-ray CT, if it takes only 0.1 second, like the popcorn process, that's too fast. If it takes four days, like this germination process, that is a good pace actually on the slow side. And for everything in between, you can always compare the duration of the process and the duration of the CT scan to decide whether or not the process you're interested in happens too fast. Now, if it turns out that the process you wanna study happens too fast, do we need to give up? Well, not exactly. So if something happens too fast to do decent CT scans, you can always try 2D measurements. You can just collect the 2D projections and you might be able to get a whole lot of information from it. So before you give up on the CT scans or any X-ray imaging, you might wanna try 2D. So this example is showing a process of water being absorbed by superabsorbent. And if this is happening inside of a opaque container, you can't really see what's going on, but just by doing 2D projection imaging, you can clearly see the process of this water being uh, absorbed by the superabsorbent. And this video, by the way, was collected at 60 frames per second. So that's the level of speed you can achieve if you give up on 3D CT and just use 2D projections. Okay, so that's for the duration of the process. Now let's talk about the sample environment. For the sample environment factors, there are many different things you can change, but the typical ones include the temperature, you can heat or cool the sample, or humidity, or stress, you can add tensile or compressive stress to the sample. You can even charge or discharge a battery and see what happens to it. So those are some of the typical environmental parameters uh, you might wanna change. And to change those parameters or an environment, you're going to need some sort of institute chamber. Now, what is required of an institute chamber to use it for X-ray CT measurements? There are a couple of 
basic or fundamental requirements. So this is what a typical CT scanner with a cone beam and geometry looks like. So you have the X-ray source and you have the sample stage that rotates the sample and you have a 2D detector. To control the environment of the sample, you would add some sort of institute chamber around the sample. And this is kind of obvious, but X-rays need to get through this chamber to get to the detector to give you a good image. So one of the things you need is an X-ray transparent window so that the X-rays can get through the chamber. Now, the other thing to consider is most of the institute chambers have some sort of power supply cable or signal cable. Sometimes you might even have tubes or hoses coming out of this chamber. But on most of the conventional CT scanners, the sample is gonna rotate. So you have to make sure that the sample sometimes with the chamber can rotate smoothly without pulling the cables or cables don't get tangled or get in the way of the X-rays. So those are two very basic requirements. So what kind of chambers are available off the shelf? Let's take a look at some examples. So this is a heating chamber, relatively small uh, sample chamber we use on one of our CT scanners, the Nano 3DX. And at this stage can heat the sample up to 200 degrees and it can accommodate a sample up to five millimeters in diameter. And there is a cooling version of this stage. And at this stage can change the sample temperature to minus 20 degrees up to room temperature, the same sample size. This one can change the temperature and the stress at the same time. So you can heat the sample up to, up to 200 degrees. And also you're gonna add a stress up to 200 Newtons. And these are relatively small and compact institute chambers you can combine with high resolution CT scanners. Another place you can look at is this company, Devin. So Devin makes a wide variety of institute chambers for temperature control and stress control. And their chambers can be combined with a number of commercially available CT scanners. I'm gonna show you an example of one of the Devin stages combined with one of the Rigaku CT scanners. So this is the Devin CT500. This is a stress control stage. And it's combined with the CT Lab HX benchtop CT scanner. And on this system, we have the X-ray source behind this wall. And you might notice, although I don't have any scale in this picture, that this stage is relatively thin or small. And that is a good thing if you want to increase the resolution, because when you use a cone beam geometry and you want to increase the resolution, you have to bring the sample very close to the X-ray source. And you can do so if the sample chamber is also small and it can get close to the X-ray source. Now, the cone beam on this system comes from the left side like this. So this is the X-ray transparent window. Now, at the bottom, you also see some cables nicely wrapped. And here is another thing to note about the cables. So those cables need to come out of the radiation enclosure at some point to get to the power supply or control computer. And to do this, you can't simply drill a hole on the side of a radiation enclosure because you have to keep that enclosure radiation shielded. So instead of during drilling a hole, uh, you probably need some sort of duct. You might need a um, double plated wall to handle the cables. So that's another thing to keep in mind about the cables. Okay. Now, depending on the parameter you're trying to control, you might ask, well, can we make our own stage? The general answer to this question is yes. Maybe all you need is just a Peltier cooler, heat sink, and a power supply to just keep the sample cool. And if that's all you need, you, know, you can make your own stage. But when you make your own stage, one thing to be careful about is Whatever environment parameter you're trying to control, you have to shield it and limit it to the sample area, meaning that if you make your own heating stage, for example, 
you don't want to heat the entire CT scanner and possibly damage it. So when you make your own stage, make sure that everything is shielded uh, just to around the sample area. Okay. Now, we talked about quite a bit about the cable handling, and you might be thinking that, well, what if we don't want to rotate the sample? We don't want to deal with all these cables. You might not want to rotate or move the sample for many reasons. It could be the cable handling, or you could have some loose powder or liquid in your system and you just don't want to move it. If that's the case, you can use a gantry system. On the gantry system, the X-ray source sits on one side and you have the sample in between. And the sample usually sits on some sort of relatively X-ray transparent uh, table or bed. Then you have the detector on the other side. To do a CT scan, you can rotate the X-ray source and detector around the sample so that you can keep the sample still. So this is how a gantry system works. And this is an example of a gantry system. This is our CT Lab GX. And this is where the sample goes in and the X-ray source and detector are inside of this round shaped radiation enclosure and they go around the sample to do a CT scan. So with this gantry geometry, you don't need to worry about moving or rotating the sample. Okay. So we just talked about the duration of the process and the sample environment as two main things to consider. Now, let's think about how to plan experiments. So to plan your experiments, always start with the duration of the process and think about how long this entire change you're trying to image takes. Then pay attention to the storage space. Because when you do 4D or in-studio CT scans, you can easily collect 10, 20, 30 scans, 10 gigabyte each, for example. And that's a whole lot of data to store. And also, it could take a lot of work and time to analyze them all later. So you might want to think about the storage space and the file size. And always you know, think about how much time you can spend on this project, including the measurements and analysis and always run some test scans and do quick analysis. You want to do test scans and quick analysis before you start the entire experiment because you need to make sure that the image quality is good enough to do the quantitative analysis you're planning to do later. So you want to make sure that that's the case before you start running 10, 20 scans. Now, to do the test scan and also set the measurement conditions, you will need to know how much time you can spend per CT scan. And to figure that out, you can ask yourself this question. So how long is the whole process? This is the duration of the process. And how many CT scans do I want to analyze or do I need to analyze? By answering those two questions and doing the math, you will know the duration of the CT scan. This is how much time you can spend per scan. And when you get to this point, you're either looking at a relatively fast change or a slow change. And depending on which one you're looking at, the strategy changes a little bit. So let's talk about the fast change first. When you're looking at a fast change, that means that you don't have a whole lot of time. And that means that you have to run scans very fast. So the question is, how can we scan faster? The thing is, we always want high resolution and low noise image like this one, assuming that you already have a good contrast. We don't want low resolution or high noise image. You can increase the resolution by using a smaller voxel size. You might have to change your geometry to, you can also lower the tube current if you're using cone beam geometry and increase the resolution. For the noise level, you could use higher X-ray power, although that could be limited by the X-ray source you have. You can always run a slower scan or do you know, spend longer time to reduce the noise level. But again, the problem is when you're looking at a fast change, you're gonna have to do faster scans. And that means that your image tends to have high level of noise. So 
we have to figure out a way to compensate for this. And there are a couple of things you can do. One is to shorten the source to detector distance. When you bring the X-ray source and detector closer to each other, you can increase the X-ray count and reduce the noise level. Or you can use a higher tube current if you have room for it. Or you can bin or combine pixels or voxels to increase the X-ray count per voxel. And all those three things will reduce the noise level, but at the same time, they reduce the resolution. So you wanna figure out a good balance of measurement conditions that can give you medium resolution and decently low noise level. So this is the basic strategy when you're looking at a fast change. Now I'm gonna show you another kind of trick when you're in this uh, situation. And that is to use deep learning super resolution. So here's how it works. I'm gonna use an example uh, that you can find in Wang's paper. You can see the original paper for more details, but here is how you use super resolution. So you collect low resolution data at high speed. You can do this very fast. Then you can spend a long time and collect high resolution data from the exactly the same sample. We're looking at an example of a geological sample. So anyway, you use the same sample and scan low resolution data fast and high resolution data slow. Then you show both of them to a deep learning program. And this deep learning program will learn the relationship between the two. And once you do this, you can just go ahead and run a bunch of fast low resolution scans to do your 40 or institute measurements. And this is one of the low resolution images. Now you show this low resolution image to the trained deep learning program. And this deep learning program can artificially recover the resolution and also reduce the noise level at the same time. So you can get this high resolution, low noise image without doing a long scan. So this is called super resolution. And this doesn't necessarily work for every case, but if this works, this is a good trick to use. Okay, so that's for the fast change. Now let's take a look at slow change. When you're looking at a slow change, you have a whole lot of time. You get to do very slow scans and you know, spend longer time. But is the longer the scan is, the better? Well, it usually is. So let's take a look at this experiment. Those are 2D projections, not 3D CT, just 2D projections of air and a plastic container and water in the plastic container. The first image was collected at 0.125 second exposure time. And that image looks a little bit noisy. But as you spend longer time, you can see that the signal to noise ratio improves, meaning that the noise level goes down when you spend a longer time. So this experiment tells us that yes, the longer the scan is, the better. But it is the case as far as the sample doesn't change. But the whole point of a 40 or institute measurements is to look at something that changes. So this rule really doesn't apply. So let's think about this case. Something about the sample changes over the course of five hours like this. And when you use X-ray CT, you're usually looking at the scale change. It could be the size or shape of the sample. It could be the porosity. Something scale-wise is changing in the sample. And if the change happens, like you see in this graph, over a course of five hours, and if we need only five scans to figure out this process, then we get to spend one hour per scan. So what happens if we actually run one hour scans? This is how it would go. So you divide this process into five sections and run one hour scan five times. The first scan is gonna look probably fine because the sample is not gonna change that much. But by the time you're doing scan number four, the sample is gonna change 
this much while you're doing a scan. And if this is like the subject is moving around or changing its shape while you're photographing it. That means you're going to have a blurred image. So instead, just because you have five hours, that doesn't mean that you want to spend one hour for each scan. Instead, you might want to do something more like 10 minute scans. If you do that, you will still have five scans, but each scan does not cover a whole, whole lot of change in the sample. So you can get a pretty crisp image. So let's take a look at an actual CT scan examples. This is a CT scan cross section of bread dough in the middle of the rising process. And this is a four minute scan. Four minute is not that much of a time and dough rising process takes about an hour. So you would have think, okay, we can spend a four minutes. But if you actually do that, you get this image, which has kind of doubled or tripled borderline because the dough was still rising in this four minute scan. You can also see this void is changing its size and shape. So this is not a really good image. It's really blurred and you can't see the details. So instead of spending four minutes, you could do an 18 second scan. And this looks a lot better. You can see very sharp edge and clearly see the shape and size of this void, for example. So this is a good example of not, it's not a good idea to spend a whole a lot of time to do just one scan, just because you have a lot of time. If the sample keeps changing, you might want to do a scan very fast anyway. So that's the strategy for a slow change. Okay, so let me wrap this up a little bit before we move on to looking at examples. So when you plan experiments, you want to do that based on the duration of the process, and also you want to pay attention to the rate of the change and make sure that you have a necessary image quality for the quantitative analysis you want to do later and always think about the file size. Okay, so what are the typical processes you can see using X-ray CT? And these are, this is just a short list of things a lot of people do typically. So you can look at a heating or cooling process. You can look at shape change under stress. You can also look at diffusion or absorption process, growth process, including germination process. You can also use 4D CT to observe degradation or weathering process. So let's take a look at the first example. Can we image an explosion? Usually an explosion happens too fast. So we really can do good CT measurements of an explosion. But just to make a point that this is all about the balance between the duration of the process and the duration of a CT scan, I'm gonna show you an example of a very slow explosion. So what we did was to mix some foaming agent into a little pile of clay and we heated up the entire pile of clay to let the foam slowly explode this pile of clay. And we did a very fast CT scans and it got this 40 CT image. So you can see this pile of clay explode in 3D. And you can do this because the duration of the process in this case was 198 seconds. And the duration of CT scan was nine seconds. So as far as that balance works, and you can see even a slow explosion. Now let's take a look at something more normal. What happens when we heat salami? Let's say up to 200 degrees. These are before and after pictures of a small piece of salami. We heat it up to 200 degrees. The after picture doesn't look too good. It's all burnt and you see a lot of boys inside. But you can see how exactly this happened by doing in studio CT. So this is the first scan and we did each scan in 18 seconds and the first one was at 30 degrees. We don't see a lot of boys and red represents 
protein rich part and the pink represents fat rich part. Then we go to 70 degrees and nothing really changed that much. But when we went to 150 degrees, we started to see a lot of voice. And by comparing the 70 degree and 150 degree pictures, you can see that the boys are showing up where the fat was. Then you go to 200 degrees and you see even larger boys. So this experiment, of course, and helps us to see visually how this happens, but you can also quantify things like the volume of the boy from the CT images. So these are cross sections collected from 30 to 200 degrees and the void shows up almost black and you can segment that as a void and the void is colored blue in those pictures. Then you can calculate the void volume and plot it against the temperature like this. And you can see that this change happens a little bit uh, exponentially, not very linear. It uh, starts very slow and it goes really fast once you reach a certain temperature. So this is an example of a high temperature in situ CT and a quantitative analysis. Let's take a look at another example of a heating experiment. So what happens if we leave soft gel capsules in the car? Let's say that we do this in the middle of summer in Texas. It can get really, really hot in those cars. So it's probably not a good idea to leave soft gel capsules in the car, but you might want to know what happens because you're making those soft gel capsules or tablets and you need to know what could happen to them in the harsh environment. And this is one of the things you can do with the Institute CT. You can simulate the harsh environment and see what happens to your samples. So this is a CT scan of a vitamin E soft gel. And this soft gel capsule was sitting on top of a heat uh, plate, a hot plate. And it was covered so that the air temperature goes up to about 50 degrees. So I'm trying to simulate what happens in the car when it gets really hot. At the beginning of the experiment, I didn't see anything wrong about this capsule, but 80 seconds later, it started to melt at the bottom. And 160 seconds later, it melted some more and the entire capsule started to get deformed. And 300 seconds or five minutes later, it started to bubble at the bottom. So as you can see in this example, uh, this is in you know, one way to simulate on uh, a harsh or challenging environment for your products and observe the degradation process. Okay, now let's take a look at some example of the stress controlled CT measurements. These are cross sections of shoe sole under different levels of stress. The first one was at no stress. Then the second one was under seven megapascal and 14 megapascal and back to zero megapascal stress level. You can see that the, at the end, when we relieved the stress, this foam material didn't quite go back to the original shape. And those are just cross sections, but we of course have the full 3D images. That means we can analyze things like the pore size distribution. And this is the result of the no stress state pore size analysis. The darker color, the purple to navy blue, they represent small pores, about 30 microns or less. And bright colors, white and the yellow, they indicate large pores close to 100 microns. Now, when this foam goes under stress, all of the pores change their sizes, usually towards the smaller side. And then when you go to 14 megapascal, all of the bright, large pores disappear. Then when you go back to zero megapascal, some of them come back. By comparing those images, you might notice that those pores, the purple ones, those are small from the beginning. And they don't change their sizes that much when you go to 14 megapascal. But if you look at this one, this one was about 90 microns. And this goes all the way down to about 30 microns purple. 
then that particular one doesn't quite go back to 90 microns. It goes back to only orange, that's more like 50 microns. So by doing this type of analysis, you can study how different sized pores interact with the stress differently. And this is one example of using INSTU CT for this type of material analysis. Now let's take a look at something a little bit different. So these are 3D rendered images of steel wool CT scans under, again, different levels of stress. And as you increase the compressive stress on this steel wool, on obviously the steel wool shrinks. And when it shrinks, the steel fibers are changing their orientations inside. And that's another thing you can visualize and quantitatively analyze. And these are the results. So at the beginning, you see a lot of red fibers. So red indicates that the fibers were vertical and blue indicates that it was more about 45 degrees and green indicates that the fibers were horizontal. So at the beginning of the experiment, when there was no stress, there were a lot of red vertical fibers. Then we increased the stress and you can see that the red fibers disappear gradually, then they become more green at the end. And this of course makes sense. Those fibers were changing their orientations to accommodate the stress to shrink the entire volume. But this is one of the things you can analyze using INSTU CD. Let me show you another example of uh, stress measurement. So this is a centered material, cylinder shaped, that it has very low density and soft material at the core. And we added 20 newtons to the sample and nothing really changed. Then when we went up to 50 newtons, the outside of cinder material cracked. So this type of experiment can tell you when the material cracks, the hard material cracks, and also you can look at the cross sections and analyze things like the width of the crack or length of the crack. Also where exactly the cracks initiate or how they propagate. So you can use a stress control, the CT for this type of analysis too. Okay. Let's take a look at something different. So next one is diffusion or absorption experiment. To see um, absorption process as a time result, the CT measurements. We took a little bit of a super absorbent from a baby diaper and put it in a small container and let it absorb water and observe the entire absorption process. So this is the first scan and the moisture on is colored blue and there are tiny bits of um, moist parts in this baby diaper or super absorbent at the beginning, but not much. 30 seconds later, you see a lot of water being absorbed at the top. And 60 seconds later, you realize that there is a whole lot of water being absorbed towards the edge of this material and where it's close to the outside wrapper, but not so much at the center. And this trend continues to 120 seconds. So this is a way to visually see where and how water gets absorbed into this material. And again, you can look at the cross sections and the segment where the water is and the segmented area is colored pink in those pictures and calculate the entire water volume and plot it against time. And this graph looks a little bit different from the one we saw for the salami experiment and it is more linear. So you can see that this absorption process happens more linearly. Okay, so this is a time resolved measurement, but let's take a look at another example of time resolved measurement. So the bread though, we already sold two scans at the beginning, but let's take a look at the entire process. So this is the bread dough I used for the experiment. I made a pretty simple bread dough and made it into a small, like a dinner roll that's a little over an inch. Then I put this dough on this table of a gantry system. I used the gantry system for this experiment because 
this dough was relatively soft. And I knew that I was going to have to do very fast scans. And I didn't want the dough to wiggle when you scan or spin the sample very fast. So I used a gantry system for this experiment. And this was the first scan. You already see a lot of voids inside. So I think the proofing or rising process had started even before I did the scan. But let's just mark this as zero minute. 20 minutes later, the boys got bigger and the entire dough got bigger, so it's rising. And 15 minutes later, it's even bigger. Then 80 minutes later, now it didn't change that much compared to 15 minutes. So probably around the 50 uh, minute mark, this dough had uh, fully risen. And that probably was the time I should have moved on to the next step. But I wasn't not gonna eat this bread, so I just let it sit and went to 110 minutes and did another scan. And this one doesn't look much different. If anything, it looks a little bit smaller than 80 minute scan. Then 18 hours later, this dough completely collapsed. But from the outside, it didn't look any different. But again, by doing a CT scan, you can see what's going on inside and realize that this dough completely collapsed after 18 hours. So this is a great way to see how the proofing or rising process, and you can do this for baking process too, um, to see the inside of the dough and study the proofing process. But you can always quantify the results too. So this is a, one of the cross sections of this bread dough, and you can easily segment this into the dough and the boys and calculate their volumes and plot them against time. The black squares are the total volumes. That means uh, it's the dough plus the boys. And that number increases, then decreases. And you can see that the total volume peaked 15 minutes after the entire process started. Now, if you just look at the dough volume without the boys, you can see that that was decreasing. And one of the reasons why the dough volume decreased in this experiment was that I did not coat or cover the dough. When you prepare bread dough, you're supposed to coat the dough with oil and cover it with wet cloth so that the dough is not going to dry up. Um, my excuse is that I was not going to eat it, so I really didn't care how it was going to taste, so I didn't coat or cover the dough. And that ended up making the dough really dry and while I was doing this experiment. So that's probably one of the reasons um, the dough volume decreased. Anyway, now we have those two numbers and that means we can calculate the void percentage. And that turned out to be increasing the entire time. So anyway, this is an example of some quantitative analysis you can do on bread dough during the proofing process. And we did this only for one kind of dough, but you can do this to see the effect of a different quality of yeast flour or what could happen when you add a certain kind or level of sugar, salt, or fat to the dough and there are effects on the dough or bread yield, for example. So. Proofing and baking processes are uh, the areas people use X-ray CD quite a bit. Okay, let's take a look at another time resolved experiment. So this one is a germination process. And I'm gonna show you an example of a pansy seed. And I took this example from this Kunishima's paper. Again, you can refer to the original paper for more details. So what they did was to put a pansy seed in a water for a certain amount of time, then they took the seed out and put it on a little small piece of wax to do a CT scan. And this is what a typical CT cross section looked like. Because the seed on the outer part of the seed and embryo and the water didn't have a lot of density contrast, the CT image um, ended up having a really low contrast. They tried a denoising. It helped a little bit, but not much. So they used phase retrieval treatment to increase the contrast. And they used this one for the analysis. 
And this is a result from a dry seed. So this seed didn't go into water at all, but you can see the seed itself and you can see the embryo segmented. And the cross sections here are representing the embryo cross sections from day one to day six. And although this seed didn't get any water, you can see that the embryo was growing. Now, if you do the same experiment on the seed that was in the water for eight hours, you can see that the embryo grows better, faster. And this one was in the water for 48 hours. And clearly this one uh, grows a lot better than the first two. And let's compare all three. So this was the dry seed. And this was after eight hours of watering. And this one was after the 48 hour of watering. And you can clearly see the difference of the embryo's growth. And you can, do this with x-ray CT because x-ray CT is non-destructive. If you had to section the seed to see what's going on inside, and you would be killing the seed at that point. But if you use x-ray CT, you can continue to monitor the same seed throughout the process of germination. Okay. So we looked at uh, some of the typical 4D and inch tube applications. But there is one more example I want to share with you. So can we see airflow in lungs? Well, of course, you cannot see airflow directly using x-rays, but you can see the tissue movement in lungs. And this means that you can calculate the airflow based on the lung tissue movement. And that is what the company 4D Medical does to create a video like this. These arrows represent the airflow amount and direction mapped in lungs of a mouse. The image was created by using a technology to calculate the airflow based on the lung tissue movement imaged by using x-rays. And we partner with them and provide some of the hardware part for x-ray imaging, but 4D Medical is the company um, that created this technology and they're the innovator and we have been very fortunate to work with them. And this technology helps doctors see where exactly the problem is in lungs and keep necessary treatment less invasive. I just wanted to share this example as well uh, as one of the really cool things we can do by using X-ray CT. Okay, so you just learned some keys to 4D and Institute CT measurements and how to plan experiments and took a look at 40 and institute application examples. As always, all images you saw today were collected on the Rigaku CT scanners. And if you wanna learn more about them, please contact your local sales representative. And if you don't know who they are, you can go to rigaku.com and contact to find who's in your area. The next event is X-ray CT virtual workshop series. And the topic is viewer's choice. So we're gonna go back to the interactive workshop next month. And we asked the audience to pick their favorite topic and you chose ImageJ. So we're gonna do ImageJ interactive workshop on November 17th, Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific and 2 p.m. Eastern. Thank you for staying to the end. Back to you, Tom. Thanks, Aya. Uh, excellent presentation today. So uh, we do have time for a short Q&A. Um, we've had one uh, very good question come in so far. If, uh, if others have questions, please go ahead and submit them into the uh, Q&A button there. Um, but the first question, Aya, came from Michelle, and it is, um, you know, what kind of software is required to, to do these 4D processing, or anything special for the imaging, or I mean, I'm sorry, for the uh, for the data processing after you've collected the images? Uh, sure, that's a good question. To do the segmentation or quantitative analysis, um, one scan at a time, you don't need anything special. But if you wanna look at the image with the time as scale, meaning that you can you know, see what's going on as a video with the time as one scale, then 
you can do that with Dragonfly. Dragonfly that has the fourth dimension as time. You can use ImageJ as well. ImageJ uh, can handle four dimension uh, data set too. Okay, okay. I probably should have also said that you need a pretty good computer to do this anyway. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Because you're looking absolutely. at a lot of data. You're going to be crunching a lot of, yeah, crunching mm -hmm. a lot of uh, images here. So, mm -hmm. um, okay, next question we've got here is from uh, Abdel Monem, and uh, he's asking, is Regaku CT only geometrical or optical as well? So I think he's referring to... Uh, the magnification. Magnification, yeah. Uh, if not, let us know. Um, for the magnification, we have two systems. One is the cone beam geometric magnification based system. And we also have a high resolution scanner called the Nano 3DX. And this one uses optical magnification and it can go to the sub micron resolution. So we have them both. Okay, all right. And then to, uh, to answer Uwe's question, uh, the, this presentation, um, the video will be available offline. Um, if you would like uh, some uh, some copies of the slides from the uh, slides from this presentation, you can contact us directly, and uh, we can send you some, yeah, we can some send specific it to you. slides. It's a pretty big PowerPoint file, but <laughs> right, right. If you want the slides, let us know. All right. So, uh, so that's all. That's all the questions we have. I think we can uh, we can take a break there. Um, if additional questions come in, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. All right, so um, oh, we hold on, oh, we just had one come in. We okay. just had one come in. All right, <laughs> okay. well, hold on a second. Oh, no, they're all coming in. Okay. Um, Aya, what is the correction you need to consider because of the X-ray flux changes over the course of time, or are there considerations due to flux changes in a 4D experiment? So uh, there are two aspects to it. It's a really good question, by the way. Um, the X-ray intensity could decrease over time because of the tube aging, um, possibly detector aging, but that really shouldn't happen so fast that you have to do correction for them if you're gonna do 40 experiments in a couple of days, let's say. Um, if you are monitoring something that happens over, let's say six months, maybe even a year, that's possible then you might need to consider the intensity change because of the tube and detector. The easiest way to do it is to run a histogram normalization across all the scans. Okay. And that you might have to do depending on the experiment or the sample you're looking at, because if the sample on uh, total absorption rate changes. Let's say the sample dries up and it loses water and it becomes less absorbing during the in studio 4D measurements. That could have changed the overall gray level. So for that, again, you can do histogram normalization. You just pick one scan out of the series and normalize all other scans against the first scan, for example so that they all have uh, the same range of histogram. That's the easiest way to correct for it. Okay, okay. So Abdel, uh, Abdel Monem uh, came up, has a, uh, has a follow-up question. Is, uh, is, there an is there an instrument that has both geometrical and optical magnification? They are, we don't have one, but uh, generally speaking, you can combine those two as well. Okay, okay, very good. All right, so um, that is all the time we have um, for today. Uh, and again, if additional questions, if you have additional questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to Aya. Uh, you can find her on LinkedIn, et cetera. Um, so with any other questions. Um, so as I said earlier, a recording of the webinar will be made available tomorrow and an email will go out to all the registrants with instructions on how to view that recorded presentation. Lastly, after the close of the webinar today, you'll be automatically directed to a landing page on the Regaku website with a link to our final workshop of the year, the viewer's choice session, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, that link was also shared in the chat. Um, we hope that you can tune in for that one as well. And thanks again to everyone for attending. We hope to see you next month. Thank you.